of us are ready for double honor this year. If you are ready for double honor this year, let's give God all glory for all he has done. Let's give him all the glory. Go ahead because nothing will remain the same in your life. In Jesus' mighty name, I want you to tell your neighbor, nothing will remain the same in my life. Go ahead and tell someone else, nothing will remain the same in my life this year. Nothing will remain the same. I am destined for double honor this year. I am destined for promotions and lifting this year. My life will never remain the same in the name of Jesus. To God alone be all the glory. Also, let us thank God for all the testimonies we had this morning. Let us give him all the glory for all the testimonies. Lord, we worship your name. Receive all the honor in Jesus' precious name. Spirit of the living God, I ask for your power of your word this morning. As your word comes forth, I pray the heart will be ready. Our heart will receive. Lord, I come against the spirit that twists God's word. I come against the spirit of religion. I come against the spirit of tradition. I come against the spirit of stubbornness. Let the power of your word break, break every hold in our heart in the name of Jesus so that your word can have its free course in our life and no one will ever remain the same. Receive all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. We may be said that you are welcome this morning in Jesus' precious name. We are going to go into the word of the Lord and church Today is going to be very important because we've just finished our concluded our 21 day prayer and fasting. Prayer is what to do when the promise of God goes forth. The next thing to do is to pray to see its fulfillment. You don't wait for promises or prophecies. You pray them to manifestations. And that is what we have done for 21 days. And my prayer is that your own manifestations will be established in Jesus' name. In the precious name of Jesus, for in every area of burden and pain in your life, God's double honor will overtake you. In Jesus' precious name. We are going to go into God's word. Let me say something with you to you this morning, and if you can get this and run with it, you will amaze yourself. I search through the scriptures, and I search by the help of the Holy Ghost into my own spirit, and I search everywhere, I found out when it comes to experiencing or enjoying the blessing of God, when it comes to receiving everything that God has, there is only one thing that is most important. Obedience. Nothing else. Nothing is more important than obedience. If you want to get God into the situations of lives, nothing more important than your obedience. And when we search through scriptures, those that faced severe penalties or, or punishment from the Lord for one thing or the other, you, you find out that uh, disobedience was their undoing. If you also want to go through the scriptures, those that excel, those that walk in the fullness of the blessing of God and provision of God for their lives, it's because of their obedience. Is somebody hearing me this morning? So, the only most important thing to experience God's power, the only most important thing to smoothly, freely, easily enjoy the best of God is obedience. And my prayer is that you will be empowered this morning 
and every sense of pride because when we discount what God says, it's as a result of pride in our heart. That's what the Bible calls the pride of the heart. Now, every disobedience in the life of a Christian is on the premise that we know the better way. Every disobedience, they have explanation. You understand what I'm saying? For example, if you break a law and you go to the court and you are able to talk well, even though you have broken the law, now you can move, you can get away freely. Especially if you have a good lawyer. Is that right? But it doesn't apply like that to God. It's either obedience or disobedience. When it comes to God, it's either you do it or you have disobeyed. There is nothing but when, if, it's because. If you are going to get the best of God in your life, God will never be in your ship with disobedience. Take it or leave it. You know, when something goes wrong, we have to explain ourselves to our heads of department or maybe a pastor with tell stories or our managers at work or in the court, we tell our stories. What are we trying to do? We are weighing in on their emotions. Is that right? So there is a way you can present it if that they will agree. Even when you are lying, your body language can make them think. You, how many of us have told lies before in some places? And they, you know it was a lie, and they believe you. Is that right? So you, the Lord bless you. So you, you overthrow their emotions. I'm, I'm showing you something because the Lord heavily laid this in my heart. God is not a man that he should lie. There is nothing that he promised that he cannot fulfill. But God does not operate by emotion. So anything you do that's an outburst of emotion, God is not in there. No matter how well you feel after it. So, and I know we are, so sometimes we get carried away and think that is the same thing that move God. That's why tears don't move God. Tears can move a man. If I don't want to do something with you or something for you, if you cry too much, I get, it stresses me out. So by the time you start crying, I say, just go, get out of my face. Now, just take it. That's the truth. But emotions never move God. Praise the Lord. And I know people can put, show, put a show together. When I was in Canada many years back, many, many years back, there was something that was popular in Canada for especially immigrants to get papers were asylums and all those things. Some people would tell a lie that that lie themselves, they have believed it. One lady went before an immigration panel and said they raped all her sisters. They raped her. They killed her father and brothers. And she started crying. And the judge stood up and gave his handkerchief. <laughs> and gave her a hug. Now, what do you think that is? Paper, green card. <laughs> I just said, as long as you've been around, it's 30 years, they backdated it. Emotions. Does that make sense? There are times we go meet people, not judges, that you come, you, you know you have to tell a lie to come out of it. And you may succeed, you may not succeed sometimes. But I'm trying to establish something in our heart. Don't let us do that with God. It won't work. It has never worked. And maybe that's the reason why many of us are still wandering or trying to get off from certain situation. When it comes to experiencing the power of God, the hand of God, nothing is more important than obedience. And I've also found out that 
every act of obedience, a miracle is born. Every obedience. If God said, do this and you do it, something is going to happen. Every time you obey the Lord. Every time. Every time. Every time you obey God. Secondly, the Bible says, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts from yours. So, now, that's why you never apply your senses to what God is saying. The moment you are applying your senses, now you are measuring God's way with your way. He said, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Every jargon in your mind, that's not in me. My ways are not your ways. You will find out most testimonies in scriptures and most, uh, most outstanding testimonies I've seen in our lives, in our generations, in God's people, are people that just obey God foolishly. It will appear foolish at the beginning. Praise the Lord. Every act of obedience gives birth to a miracle. Every time. And our prophetic focus for this month, Job chapter 36 and verse 11, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. Now, it's also good for us to know as we get started, when it comes to obedience to God, God sees beyond what we say and what we do. He sees the heart. So that's why we cannot deceive ourselves. He sees the heart. As a matter of fact, God goes by what is in the heart before he listens to the, what we are saying. The Bible says in John chapter 2, he said, when many heard him and followed him, and followed Jesus, he said, he did not commit himself to them because no one should tell him what is in man. He knows what man is capable of doing. So, obedience, he sees the heart. So, now, everything in Christianity works by faith, right? It takes faith to do anything with God. If you're a Christian, you say you don't have faith, forget about God. Go and go somewhere else. Because it takes faith to assess God. But there is nothing called faith without obedience. So obedience is the lifeline of faith because faith is an action. It's something you obey. Faith is you believe what God says and act on it. So if you are not living in obedience, don't deceive yourself. You are not a man or a woman of faith. You can be a Christian for a long time, long-standing Christian, been in the church forever, some are somehow being in positions ordained and all those things and have zero faith. And have zero faith. The secret of people are in their stories. I followed one man for over 25 years now in the faith. One thing that I know is key in his life, he will obey anything God says. Anything. Anything. Thing. And the results are clear. So even when it comes to the lifestyle, if you are not ready to obey, don't deceive yourself to say you have faith. You don't have faith. Because faith is what you do with what you heard from the Lord. Faith is what you do. And no matter what you know, you can, you know what separate Christian from religious people or, or what separates charismatics or Pentecostals or should separate us is that we try, we must try to do. Now, you know what is religion? You know everything in the Bible, but there's nothing you apply. That's religion. For example, you see, very, you see theologians. I, I, I've seen somebody with a PhD in theology told me it's not God's will. Prosperity is not God's will. Now, the Bible says, if they obey and serve me, they will spend their days in, uh, in, in prosperity and their years. God said they will. God said, if they do it, I will do it. So, what do we, what, what's the problem in there? 
Now, if God says he has prosperity, and I also like it, then I sign up for it by my obedience. Now, what is the purpose of, in the name of theology, for somebody to say prosperity is not of God? 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, but for your sakes he became poor, so that you might become rich. God said that in his word. So what is my problem? Not to believe. Every critic of the message of prosperity, they are hypocrites. All of them. There is no one left. Now, this theologian with a PhD degree, now, I've solicited money from us before. But you don't believe in prosperity. But now you've solicited money from me. And you say, because you know, you guys have money. But you say it is wrong to have money, but you need what is wrong now. It's only when money is abused, that is what is wrong, when money is not put in its place. If they obey and serve him, they spend their days in prosperity, their years in pleasure. It is God's will for you to prosper, people of God. Now, without faith, we cannot move God, but it takes obedience to have faith. This is our year of double honor. Now, the Holy Ghost said something to me early this morning. If Christians will adopt this style, Instead of run, it's good to pray. You know, we pray in this church. But instead of praying, if you say, Well, I can't pray, I only want to do one thing. You know what that water will be? God, what must I do to receive your blessing? Because everything God wants to do is already done. You are only trying to qualify for it. So God will tell you, This is what to do. You may never have to pray for it if you do it. You may never have to pray for it if you obey God. If you want to pray less and thank God, do thanksgiving more, obey God more. If you obey God more, things will be happening in your life that you will struggle to believe. Praise the Lord. You know why we are blessed in dominion life as a church? Obedience. Anything, if I hear this, what God is saying, I'm going to do it. I'm not intimidated by numbers. I'm not intimidated by nothing. If God says it, if that is what God says, and that's what you can see in the history of this, or the journey of this church. We were less than 60 people when we bought the first building for a million dollars. Then we had 200,000 as a church. When we bought this place for $3.5 million. So from the time God spoke and the time we took step of faith, the provision appeared. We didn't even collect offerings for the building in Stockton because he only announced it once. Then we just bought the school. End of June, we had less than 20000 But by middle of August, a million and ninety-five. It's in place to put down for Brentwood. Obedience. You will never have to struggle for provisions if you learn how to obey God. And that is why Satan is always waiting to circumvent your obedience, to frustrate your obedience. There are things people say, so some people don't believe in Titan. They are you are deceiving yourself, that is the truth. Yes, you are okay, but if you know where you should have been, you will know you are not okay. Now, everybody was destined to be somewhere. But where God wants you to be, the best place for you is obedience that will take you there. That's the truth. Yes, you are okay the way you are. You are managing it. 
but you are not you are not to the maximum. You are not ma- the grace of God over your life is not maximized. Are you hearing me? If you are going to get the best from the Lord, you will learn to put all your crafty senses aside and obey God fully. If they obey and serve, they'll spend their days in prosperity. Now you are okay. Are you in prosperity? If they obey and serve, yes, you are okay. You, are, you can figure things out. But are you in abundance? If they obey and serve. So when it comes to abundance, prosperity, you can calculate it with human sense. You know why we won't need God if sense can take us there? We will not need God. Praise the Lord. So the prophecy has gone forth. What's a prophecy? A prophecy is an utterance or a declaration inspired by the Holy Spirit. A prophecy can also be inspired from scriptures. The Holy Spirit can breathe into your spirit. Faith and obedience, the two most important things. Now, we are used a lot to the spoken word, which is what we are dwelling on this morning. But let me talk about the written word. The written word is also a prophecy. If you are reading the scriptures, you are studying the word of God, and the Holy Ghost inspires scripture in your spirit, God is speaking to you from that verse. And God has spoken to me from verses of scriptures several times. That I will act on it as if God came and told me. And the Bible says the written word is the most sure word of prophecy. Most sure because it has been proven. Now, more sure than the greatest prophet that you know. Praise the Lord. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. I'm reading from the Old King James. Whereunto ye do well. In the New King James, say the prophetic word confirmed. So every prophet of scripture has been confirmed before it was written. It says, knowing the first, knowing this first, that no prophecy of, of the scripture is of any private or individual interpretations. For the prophecy came not in a whole time by the will of man, not by the will of man, but by holy men of God, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So that's why a prophecy is usually incomprehensible. We can't comprehend it. That's why a prophecy is unfathomable or unintelligible. In other words, you apply all your intellect, it won't make sense. You can't understand it. The more you think about what God is saying in prophecy, you, the more you get confused. Because the numbers, the facts are not adding up. Why? Because God is bigger than you and I. God doesn't say things based on your level. He, so if God interacts with you, he won't promise you based on your ability. He promises you, his own, he gives you his own word based on his own ability. So all of God's blessing is by God's level. Not my level, not your level. It wasn't our level to buy a school last year. It wasn't our level. I say can't figure it out up to now. It wasn't our level. So God makes promises by his own capacity, his own level. Praise the Lord. Now, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, but as it is written, I has not seen nor hear heard what has sent into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared. Now, that's what the word of God says. What he has prepared for those that love him, nobody has said it before. Nobody, no, no one has imagined it before. When it happens, it will be the first. Now, there is nothing in your own mind that you can articulate that has not been seen before. before because everything you desire is influenced by what you heard. So, God does things at his own level. 
Now he says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So they are deep. Now verse 11 says, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit is the revealer, is the custodian of God's secret. The unknown things. The Holy Ghost is the custodian. He knows everything God knows. So every time you apply human intelligence, you get sidetracked in your effort to obey God. Every time, every time you apply human intelligence. So when you look at every act of disobedience, it's because of human intelligence. You have to say, bring all your tithe to my house. Prove me that. God said, prove me. Okay, what test do we want? Now, bear every reason to be unfaithful in tithing is application of human intelligence. Either if I give it, it may not be enough. Why should I give it? I don't believe in it. Then we begin to look at some, some radio broadcasters, some people teaching against it, that Satan ordained to confuse the world, then we now forget what is in the Bible. We are saying, somebody say, they don't have, God already blessed us, so why should we try to be blessed? If they obey and serve him, if they obey and serve him, if they obey and serve him. If they obey and serve him. My first tithe in America was $32. If they obey and serve him. It is tithing. When we do with obedience, then God's power comes over it. Then it begins to climb, it begins to climb, it begins to climb. $32 becomes $1,000, $2,000, $4,000, $5,000. I have, by the grace of God, written a tithe, one-time tithe, for $12,000. The finance people are here, so I, I, I can't be lying. Not that somebody died, I, read, I inherited the money. If they obey and serve him, if they obey and serve him, if they obey and serve him, praise the Lord. If they obey and serve him. So we can calculate God with our intelligence. So when it comes to faith in God, my simple explanation to bring it down is to say blind obedience. In Acts chapter 27 from verse 9. Acts 27 verse 9. Now, most of us desire to hear the voice of God. Is that right? Some of us want to be sensitive to hear the Holy Ghost when the Holy Spirit speaks. Is that right? How many of us here doesn't like to hear God's voice and recognize it? Now, how many of us want to hear the voice of God? It's a desire. You know the problem to that one? Disobedience. God will test your obedience with small, small things. You had planned to go out at four. The Holy Spirit had an impression you don't go out. If I don't go, what would they say? But the Holy Spirit said, don't go. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit will test your obedience with small, small things. If you are not able to obey God in small, small things, God won't continue to speak to you. If you are not able to obey small, small things, forget about big things. Forget about, that's why many people have mistaken their own desire, their own ambition for the voice of God. It's what they want. They say, God said. It is what they plan. They say, it's God. They say, it's God. They say, it's God. I say, I should marry that man. And the man became a monster. 
God won't lead you to a monster. It's not God. You are yourself. It's not God. God can't match make you with a monster. Because God knew that man would become a monster or monster is hiding inside of him. We're only waiting for manifestations. Praise the Lord. In Acts chapter 27, the Bible says, Now when much time had been spent, now this was when Paul was in prison, and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over. Paul advised them, saying, Man, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the Ems man and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. So many a times we have relegated the voice of God because of popular opinions. Are you hearing me? And because the harbor was not suitable to the right to, to, to winter in, the majority advised to set sail. From there also, they said, let's continue. Then, by verse 27, the Bible says, And because we were exceedingly tempted tossed, the next day, they lighted. So, the, the ship began to sink. They were in a storm. They began to empty everything in the ship. But God has told them, no, don't go, don't go. But they did, they took consortium of ideas. And they all agree it's better to go. God's voice is only one voice. All of us here, now, they are, they, no matter how many people agree, the intelligence, the wisdom of the whole world can never, should never override the voice of God in your life. No matter how many people voted against it. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, on the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now, when neither sun nor stars appear for many days, no small tempters beat on us. All hope that we will be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, the Paul stood in the midst of them and said, so Paul was waiting in the fast. Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you, take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the sheep. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted, your, granted all you those who sail with you. So their only safety was Paul was destined to face Caesar and to continue his ministry. He said, because of that, if not because of that, because of that one, then the grace of God on you grandfathered in everybody on the boat. But he had warned them. There was a wonderful guy when we were in Georgia. He was going to travel home. Fantastic boy. One time he came to me and told me, I should never call anybody when I'm traveling again. He would be taking me to the airport, picking me up. And I had a couple of people that would do that. And he was driving limo at the airport. So he will come, no matter where I'm going, even if it's 30 minutes flight, a limo will come and pick me. Fantastic covenant guy. But no matter every, everything you know how to do, obedience must be in place. Then I look at him. He told me this story. I said, don't go on this journey. It won't work. He said, Pastor, it's going to work. He convinced me, he convinced me. I said, don't go. I don't have peace with this tree. I don't have peace. By December 31st of that year, 2004, he left. He never returned. He never returned. I've seen people destroy their lives.
for disobedience. I've seen people suffering. I know people that say suffering one thing or the other that I've told you must be doing this, this is what to do, that they won't do it. There was one of my sons in the Lord. He came to me, he said, you must hold me accountable for tithing. You must, sir, you must hold me accountable. I said, okay, what should we do? He brought the computer. He said, I should schedule his tithe, automatic. And I laughed. And I got there, I scheduled it automatically. The day he told me the day it gets paid, I put it, bill pay. The money lands on Friday to the account, money leaves on Friday. And I gave it to him. He left. He was mailing it here. We got about two or three, then we stopped getting it. I didn't say anything. Then after about six months, then he came back. So we're not talking again. He now said, sir, don't forget, I really want to serve God. I really want to be faithful, but I need you to help me. I said, how? He said, you have to hold me accountable, especially for Titan. That is my greatest struggle. I said, but where did he the last time? He said, yes. I said, but I know you canceled it. Look at me, he said, you know? I said, yeah. I said yes, because we stopped seeing the check. He said, enough forever. I said, but why didn't you tell me? I'm not going to be chasing you because of your tight. I'm not going to be chasing you. I said, I know. He felt so bad. He said, okay, we'll do this one again. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to be chasing I said, I knew. I said, I knew. So he felt bad. He's like, for the past six months, he's been deceiving me. I said, I knew. I said, we go about three. Then we didn't get it again. Is that why you didn't tell me? God didn't ask me to chase you. <laughs> he only asked me to teach you. Praise the Lord. Many people are suffering. Many people are on the same level financially. They shut open heavens on themselves because of disobedience of Titan. Let's say, I will open to you the windows of heaven. We've had among many things that open heaven means God will give you a brain booster. You'll be able to carry ideas. You will have capacity in your brain to imagine, to fathom out enterprises that will change your life. Ideas that will bring money. Now, in this world, we have people that, can, that sell ideas. And there are people that can't figure out one idea to turn to money. So say, I will open you the window of heaven. Praise the Lord. So no prophecy is ever fulfilled without the beneficiary's faith and obedience. Or faith expressed by obedience. The prophecy you don't believe and you don't obey is dead in your life. The prophecy you don't believe and you don't obey is, forget about it. Don't, don't deceive yourself. Just be praying. You don't believe it. You don't obey it. It won't work. When God spoke to us last year, he had a, 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 an advancement. I believe all the way. And we pray all the way. Now, it's not, wasn't up to me or anybody to figure out how God will do it. If I had to Tell God what I expected for advancement, I would never have asked for what we got. So we have shortchanged ourselves. So that is why you just believe, then you obey. You believe, then you obey. You believe, then you obey. Praise the Lord. So, because the fulfillment of every prophecy is empowered by your faith. Your faith in it. Luke chapter 1 and verse 45. Blessed is she who believed, or he who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her of the Lord. Now, all of us in the Christian faith today, we are hanging on to the Abrahamic covenant. The blessings of Abraham are mine. We are all tapping into it. But don't forget that obedience is at the root of the covenant. 
The covenant is in place because of Abraham's obedience. So the song alone does not bring the blessing of Abraham. It's obeying like Abraham that releases the blessing, the covenant in our lives. Everything called Abrahamic covenant. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, I don't also forget that partial or delayed obedience is disobedience in the spirit. Now, let me tell you one thing I've learned when it comes to obedience to God. When God speaks to you, because a miracle is going to be in place, it positions along the line, date by date, from the day he spoke to you, what you need to experience to maximize that blessing. In some situations, you put some men, some people in your life, you position some things who align them. That is what we call being at the right place at the right time. They will just align. If you delay for a day or two in most cases, those things won't be there for too long. They will not be there for too long. Those provisions won't always be there. So when we now finally obey, the provisions were gone. They will now begin to struggle as if God didn't speak to us in the first place. Delayed and partial obedience equals disobedience in spiritual things. In Genesis chapter 26 from verse 1, there was a famine in the land. Besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Jerah. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in a land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I'll be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I gave all these lands. I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, in verse 5, let's read together all of us. Verse 5, let's read. Let's read louder, please, one more time. So God said, all these promises he was telling Isaac, he said, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my... Many destinies are tied down today because they don't agree with the rationale behind what God is saying. When God gives us instructions to our own good, let me say something to you. God doesn't need us. We need him. No matter what we have, no matter what we can give, no matter what we can do, he does not need us. We need him. Because God can't be stranded. And there is no vacuum with God. There is not that if you don't do this thing, it will be undone. Not with God. You'll be shocked. Who will do it? Every time somebody refuses, I've seen it in this church, doing some things for the Lord and just become big headed, God always brings, that's why I don't move, I don't move. I'll just go to God. This person now is too big for me. I need a replacement. Because God cannot be stranded. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. So, I said earlier on, if you don't know how to obey God with small things, forget about big things. So, the small things are the test that you must pass to get to big stuff. The small, small things. The small, small things. Holy Spirit will inspire something in your spirit. Holy Spirit will inspire something in your spirit. Please, God doesn't play games. There was a day I wanted to write a check. I wrote, I wanted to write 200 bucks for offering. Then I wrote 500. It was a mistake. So I said, God, do you want me to now put 500 or what's going on? Yeah. God said, write your 200. I wrote it. I wanted to reap the 500. I said, don't reap it. Then I left it. I would see it every time. Then one day, the Holy Ghost speak to me one, one day. He said, today I'm going to give a special offering. I said, okay, what is it? He said, I check. God is not, 
God is the same yesterday. Let me tell you something God did in scripture that shocked me. When the Lord took Israel out of Egypt, he said, go and meet your masters. Ask for their gold and silver. Ask for their gold and silver. And easily, they gave it to them. How many of us remember the story? When they got into the wilderness, they wanted to make a sacrifice unto the Lord. God said, you remember the gold and the silver you took out of Egypt? <laughs> So, the silver and the gold, you carry on your head. <laughs> From it, I need sacrifices. Even if the money crept into your tank, uh, account, you call it miracle money, nobody knew. God knew it entered there. God told them in the wilderness, he said, of the gold and of the silver that you took out of Egypt, My prayer is that, you see, the call of God on my life is just for you to fulfill your destiny and nothing else. That's the only thing I pray for every day. For you to be the best that God created. That's what God called me for. The Bible says, Abraham was tested. So, it was a test to, before God finally signs off on the Abrahamic blessings. You said, go and kill Isaac. Let me see. You'll be claiming you love me, you love me. Okay, let me see how much. Bible said, and God tested Abraham. And Abraham actually tied the boy's leg and put a knife on his leg. God said, no, 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 don't do it. You know what the Bible says? In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 18 to 19. No, the, 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 verse 19. Verse 18, of whom it was, let me read everything, 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise, promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac, your sin shall be called. So everything, all the promises to Abraham, hung on Isaac. Now, if you kill Isaac, then you kill the promise. Does that make sense? Now, you say in Isaac... My seeds have been called. Now you have to kill Isaac. So what, where, now, where is the, prom, the bigger promise? Look at what the Bible says. Of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Verse 19. Concluding, so Abraham concluded that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So in his mind, even if I kill him, because God had promised me through Isaac, it will, it, no, now I know, because he won't lie of the bigger promise, I'm, going, I'm still going to go back home with Isaac. The New Living Translation says, verse 19, Abraham assumed that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. So in Abraham's mind, this boy will die, but he will be raised. That's the level of Abraham's obedience. Praise the Lord. So killing Isaac was the most foolish thing to do in that instance. So Isaac must have appeared untouchable. Because the promises, everything was built on him. Praise the Lord. So every time you disobey God, you have missed a miracle. Hallelujah. In Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 14, therefore the Bible says, 29, 14 of Isaiah, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among these people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent shall be hidden. Praise the, praise the Lord. Why is God saying that? Because there is always an assumption that we know what we are doing. There's always an assumption. First Corinthians chapter 30, verse 18 to 20. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. 
For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. That is why every time we explain away our disobedience is foolish craftiness to God. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, the Lord knows the thought of the wise and they are futile. So all those things you are guarding in your own senses means nothing compared to what ought to be or what God plans to do in your life. So every disobedience is traced to the feelings of knowing something or better way of doing it. And what is wisdom to God? Wisdom to God in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus was telling the story from verse 24. He was telling the story of uh, giving the parable. He said, therefore, whoever hears these things of mine and does them, I will liken to a wise man. So wisdom to God is just do what God says. And the rain descended on the, and the floors came, and winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall. So God said, you are a wise man when you do what I say. You are a foolish man when you don't do what I say, no matter what your reasons are. So obedience is the most important requirement to fulfill prophecy or to fulfill destinies. First Corinthians. Now, the Bible already tells us it will not, everything God will tell us to do will not make sense. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are. So the people in the world may not understand everything God said we should be doing in the church. That's understandable. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? May you not fall into the camp of people that will cancel you into disobedience to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Obedience. Do you know that without learning to obey God, somebody can be working in contrary to their destiny? You know, I look at the story of Paul every now and then. Paul assumed he was doing the right thing when he was persecuting the church. He didn't know he was persecuting his own future. There's always an assumption that we're doing the right thing. Nobody was paying him, but he took pleasure in killing the disciples. Praise the Lord. The Bible says in Acts chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. Acts 1, 8 to 3. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, uh, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And the devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made a work of the church and entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. The same point, I say, when he pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb? So he had been separated, he didn't know. Every assumption that is not of the Holy Ghost could be a trap of destiny. <laughs> Obedience is the most important thing to God. First, you want to hear the Holy Ghost? You will have to learn to obey the simple, simple instructions. You will never hear God's voice. It tests you with small, small things. You plan to watch TV, you say, don't watch TV. You just had an impression in your, and God will test you. It will be a test because it, if it is that TV, is the program you have never missed. Now, it won't make sense to miss it. They say, why should I watch TV? Then you now act as if you didn't hear. You turn it on. Mood will be slow at the beginning. Because you feel convicted. But 10 minutes into it, you have forgotten that God spoke to you. Some of us crave to hear the voice of God. You will never grow in that voice if you disobey Him. 
one thing I treasure the most in my Christian faith, the voice of the Holy Ghost. The voice of God. That's why I will do something. Sometimes it won't make sense to you. And um, I found out as a pastor, I don't have to explain to you. Unless you are teaching, but I want to show you something. No matter what we are doing, if you really nudge me, to not go that direction, I won't go. No matter what we are planning, we really say this is what to do. That is what I will do. The voice of God. The voice of God. Obedience. So, number one, by obedience, you are walking into the fulfillment of God's purpose and blessing for your life. Number two, you are training yourself to be sensitive to God's voice. I've seen people suffer that I know. It's only that they won't come and tell you what I discuss with them. They won't come and tell you. But I said, be doing this thing, do this and do this thing. And when something happens wrong, I know they're not doing it. One of my beloved sons reminded me a story last week, which I didn't even remember. He said, the first time I saw him, he said, the first time, he said, I told him, I see you in prison. He said, he didn't, he said, I said, do this, do this, do this, do this. He said, until he was in prison, that's when he remembered what I said. He now to be said, sir, I didn't do anything you asked me to do that time. He said, he was already sitting in prison, then he remembered. He said, the first time I saw him, I told him, I saw you in prison. Who has he is? Let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Some years back, when no client, as I entered my office, one of the protocols followed me in carrying my bag. It was the first one there. As I put my table on the, uh, 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 as I look back, the Holy Spirit opened my eyes. I saw him. This is a different story. I said, kneel down, let's pray. As I began to pray, based on what uh, I said, Father, in the precious name of Jesus, every plan to go to prison is supported in your life. And I prayed against this. I said, go and tell me, call your parents. This is serious stuff. Everybody needs to fast for three days or else you will go to jail. Now, I did not know what was going on. They were already in the apartment that they live. One guy had raped a girl. And he walked out. He used the gym a lot. He walked out. So by the time they did the height, he's tall, he's this. Police are started investigating him. They are already nailing that crime on him. What if we had not fasted? What if God had not revealed it? So when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it's more than speaking in tongues. It's good to speak in tongues. That's power in prayer, power in everything. But Holy Ghost is carrying God's spirit on your inside. It's carrying God's spirit on your inside. Who doesn't want to carry God? My prayer is that this year, you will be empowered by the Holy Ghost. All the way that you will not miss a divine signal. Amen. You will not miss a divine direction. Amen. You will not disobey God once. Amen. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let me close Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 and 2. Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Let's read together all of us. Want to go? Stop. Let's rise to our feet. We're going to do it again. Let's read it like we have life in us. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2. Let's read it. Everybody, want to go? By the time you now read to verse 13, you see all kinds of blessings. So, to experience his blessing is contingent on your obedience. If they obey, if you obey, all this blessing. So, if you don't obey, don't pretend to be praying for the blessing. 
If they obey, God has not removed the condition, he will not remove the condition of obedience. If they obey, if they obey, if you want to experience God's blessing. Now, when you talk about all of God's blessings is not defined by money. But money gives an expression to his blessing. Does that make sense? Money alone can never, to define God's blessing and limit it to money, that is to reduce God to material things. But the blessing of God is also expressed by money. Does that make sense? The, as you stand now, as you are sitting, money is around you. Praise the Lord. Every suit, every dress, every outfit you have on now, there is another outfit you can buy for 10% of what this one costs you, but they won't look the same. What do I mean? You buy whatever you are wearing for $100. There is, there is an outfit for $10, but it's only that they won't look the same. <laughs> there is a shoe for $10. But it won't look like the one you bought for 200 or 100, bu- or 100 bucks. In fact, there is one for $3. But it won't look the same. And in some situations, if it looks the same, it may be the one they have won in 1970. <laughs> so, the blessing of God is also expressed. Now, when he said, your days in pleasures, that's comfort. It takes money to buy comfort. Does that make sense? That's some of us here. The money you are spending to buy dresses for yourself 20 years ago is not the same thing you are buying today. Some of you don't even go to the store you used to go again. Because level has changed. Is that not it? So money alone does not define it, but money also gives an expression. Especially as long as you are still in this world, you will transact businesses with money. God gives you vision and blessing and grace to build empire, to build stuff. You are going to give money to where you are buying the land. You won't give them confession of it. Or you give them prophetic focus and say, I need two acres of land. <laughs> Be confessing this scripture, give me the title. The word of God is powerful. You go to the dealership, you give them our prophetic focus. You say, This is how we are ready. Everything inside it is this month. I'm going on with this car. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, I test, I do all kinds of stuff. Many years back, somebody working in our yard, he did good work, construction. This was 2007. And we've been talking about Christian. He said, oh, you're a pastor. So the guy will come in and say, oh, Rev? Oh, Rev? Oh, what do you believe about salvation? What about heaven? What about revelation? We'll talk every time. It was the owner. So when he finished working. So I said, John, hi, how are you? Glad working with you. It was the day I was, the last day. I said, so thank you very much. Oh, I'm even glad that you are a Christian that came to work on my yard. We've got along very well. We agree in the spirit. The Lord bless you. If I have another job next time, I will call you. Then I walk. <laughs> then he said, he said, Rev. He said, Rev. I said, what? He said, what about the money? I said, which money? He said, you know, you gave me this amount, the balance, the chunk of it. Are you not a man of faith? He said, how? I said, I thought you, you know I'm anointed, right? He said, yes. Oh, I said, okay, I haven't prayed. Let me pray for you. <laughs> I will pray $30,000 prayer for you. Then God will give you more than 30000 Do you believe I'm anointed? He said, yes. Do you believe I pray God will do it? He said, yes. I said, so let me pray for you. I won't have to give you the 30000 When I pray, you will see money this year. Then he said, I don't understand. <laughs> I said, but you are a Christian. Don't you believe in the power of prayer? Then I walk. He said, Rev, Rev. I I found out 
they won't accept prayer in the marketplace. They won't accept prayer in the marketplace. <laughs> the man believed though, but he didn't agree. He didn't doubt that I'm anointed, but he did not agree. He took his money. So when I gave him the check, I had the check in my pocket, you know, I was just fooling around with him. So, and I gave him the check. So he realized I didn't have to write a check. Oh. He said, Rev. He's an older white guy. He said, Rev, I didn't understand uh, if, if there was a test of faith or something. So, uh, If they will accept prayer in the marketplace, <laughs> if they will accept prayer, huh? there is a piece of land at the end of this street. <laughs> Camino Ramon and Bolijakayon. Next to it is the city office. I'll go to the mayor. All of us, dominion life. <laughs> dominion from everywhere. We will gather at the city hall and pray. Everybody will lead prayer. We pray from morning to evening. They will say, Mayor, this land, we want it. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think they will agree. They will still want to see the money. So because they need to see the money, we have to be real with ourselves. I said, the love of money is evil. Money becomes evil when money becomes the driver of your destiny. My prayer is that your obedience will be complete this year. In Jesus' precious name. Ask the Lord as you approach the communion table tonight. Jesus obeyed and obeyed and obeyed until he gave his life. Baptize me with the spirit of obedience like in Jesus. I ask for the spirit of obedience, Jesus' kind of obedience. As I eat your flesh and I drink your blood, Lord, infuse me with the spirit of obedience. Infuse me with the spirit of obedience. 